All right, uh, just a heads up for everybody. We're probably gonna give about five minutes for people to continue to roll in. Um, so I wish I had a little music to play for you guys, but for now we're going to sit back and give it a few to get a few more people in the chat. It'd be nice to everybody have waiting room. Sorry, Mark. Can everybody confirm that you can hear us okay uh, in the chat? Just let us know. Yep. Okay, Sounds great. Like here. Great. Thanks, everybody. If you have questions along the way, please post your questions in the questions area of the uh, webinar, and we'll try to get to those either um, you know, through the uh, question and answer section of the webinar, or we will uh, answer them at the end. Yep, and you can send those questions privately or send to all. And no, we can't play Rick Astley. Maybe some Mariah Carey for the holidays, unless you've heard it 20 times already. All right. Yes, this is being recorded and um, I believe it will be distributed out. And I'll repeat this again in a few minutes, but this will be done on NetSparker on demand, which is slightly different. It's our cloud version. It's slightly different from the on-prem version um, with things like pre-request scripts and some of the settings. Uh, it's definitely different than the NetSparker standard version, but you'll see a lot of similarities if you use those other two products. By the way, the other person on the call, I will be the presenter, Mark Williams. The other person on the call is Mark Hodishin. He will be answering your questions as they come through. So feel free to ask questions through the text box. During about the last, we'll try to save the last 10 minutes if we can, uh, for people to have questions answered you know, verbally during the webinar but Mark Atochin can answer any questions that you have, whether you want to send them to him privately or whether you want to uh, send it out to everybody so that everybody can see the answers. And uh, Mark, were you able to confirm that the question and answer worked? Yep, looks good. I uh, just responded to one of the question or one of the responses in the uh, question section. Um, and I put my name as the answerer so people can see uh, who they're communicating with. Um, and then also looks like we got about one more minute and we're almost to the expected number of attendees. Um, So we should be good. For, we should good for be good for attendance here by 11:05, I think. Okay, 11:05 Eastern time. If you are yeah. <laughs> wondering about yeah. the time differences, the next minute. All, All right. right, I'm gonna go ahead and set myself to mute, Mark. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and get started. All right. All right. So we covered questions. Uh, I will cover again that this is on NetSparker on demand. It is the NetSparker Cloud version. It's slightly different than the on-prem version. Um, you'll be able to notice the differences and it's definitely different than the NetSparker standard version, uh, but there are similarities in the structure of building profiles and policies. So this should pertain to you as well. All right, and anything I don't cover in depth, feel free to go to netsparker.com support. 
Uh, it's got a great search feature for keywords. You put those in and it will give you uh, a little more information about different parts. We've had our support team and dev team work on building these white papers out so that you can get access to information, you know, without having to go through the process of uh, creating support tickets. All right. So the first thing you'll see when you open up NetSparker is a dashboard. Uh, it gives you nice little graphical outputs, uh, depending on what your permissions are, how many websites you can see. Uh, for this demonstration, we are going to cover some of the basics as far as creating profiles, uh, adding, adding targets, uh, creating policies. I'll touch a little bit on looking at your recent scans, knowing things about the knowledge base, and even you know, looking at uh, some of the issues, and if we have time, notifications and integrations. It'll be a pretty you know, light touch on most of that, but you'll get the fundamentals in this call or this webinar. All right, so the discovery tool is one method of adding targets. Uh, it crawls public DNS records. So if you were to configure your settings to match IP addresses and second level domains, it'll give you this dashboard output where you can select sites and simply create from there. You can also export a CSV of the sites if you would like to you know, maybe consult with management or consult with developers or admins about what sites that you would want to scan as a target. You have the options to you know, ignore or create as well. So if we were to create a site from here, it would appear in our websites list. As you can see here, and I've got a lot of our vulnerable sites here in the website list. So there is the new websites is also another way of adding an individual website without having to go through the discovery tool. You can also import websites if you have a CSV upload or if you've got a text file. We've even got you know, the ability to download samples over here if you would like to be able to see how the uh, format is. Another important piece, if you are creating many sites, uh, if you are targeting many sites, is to group them together. And you can group in any logical sense that you would like. You can see here in my demonstration, I've grouped via dev, production, QA, but you can group on uh, maybe type, uh, I've got PHP here, but I could create a PHP group. I could create a Java group. I could, uh, I could create a group with a person's name. So let's say I wanted Mark Atochin to have uh, ownership of certain sites. I could create a group just specifically donated to him and put all the sites he's responsible for into those groups. And I'll head down to the groups. And you can see how some of these logical groupings work. You can put a single target in many different groups. So you can actually group based on a lot of different uh, ways to correlate them together. Right. And let's talk about tags a little bit before we get into talking about profiles. So when we're talking about website group tags, there's also tagging for websites. You'll see tagging come up a lot throughout this presentation. It's one of the newer features we have. And being able to create tags allows you to create searchable features. So let's say we want to go and say um, admin. All right, and we want to make the admin mark. And I put a colon there and it actually creates a category and a name into the category. So I can add that to the website group. I can also say that this is a Java site. So not even doing the category, I can make this uh, group full of Java sites that, have, that are responsible to the admin mark. Hit the save button. And now I can search on those tags. So this makes a way for if you have you know, dozens, if not hundreds of groups, or in another case, you could have hundreds of sites and have searchable tags on them that you can filter through. Now, these are great ways to organize uh, large amounts of targets that you might have or large amounts of groups or issues that you might have in your platform. All right, so we will go with a test site today and I think I will go with testphp.voneweb.com. This is a test site that we use here at Invicti um, it allows us to, you know, practice our authentication. It allows us to launch scans against it, and allows us to do demos where you can see like the descriptions. All right. So just giving a higher level view of what a profile is. 
a profile has your high level content in it. It covers your scope. It covers, you know, pulling in additional sites, which can add to your scope. It covers pulling in APIs uh, through files and adding links, which can increase your scope as well. Uh, it covers, you know, your scan time window, looks at a high level view of your notifications, and this is where you will put your authentication in. Profiles are really associated to targets. And in a best practice sense, I like to make a profile for every target I have. That way I'm able to share it. You can see here that we have this default profile. If I had teammates and I made changes to the default, my teammates wouldn't be able to work on the default. But one of the first things I like to do is click on a target, come in, save profile. And we'll go ahead and call this the, since Invicti is doing the presentation today, I will make this the Invicti profile. And I have that ability here to click that share button. The primary button would make this the primary profile to the target. So you can actually set it up to where it, once you click on that target in your platform, this profile will automatically be pulled up by selecting that primary button. So I'm going to save it as both primary and shared so that my future teammates can also see this. And if I go to scan profiles, now you can see that it's on the list. This would also appear in your teammates list. It's a great way to, to collaborate and share amongst your enterprise. All right, so I'm going to go back into the profile and we're going to get started on reviewing a profile. So you can see here that you can pull in scan policy. You can pull in a uh, report policy here. This is where you can create an authentication profile. We're not going to touch on report policy and authentication profile in this call, but you can look those up on the support page. You can add custom cookies here as well, as well as uh, changing some of the crawling behavior. If you would like to, you know, slow the scans down and, you know, maybe lower the amount of bandwidth usage by disabling the crawl and attack at the same time so that it crawls and then attacks at a future time. Uh, the find and follow new links for the crawling behavior, self-explanatory, and the maximum scan duration sets up the maximum scan duration allowed during a scan. So that 48 hours there, uh, if the scan were to go on for, you know, anything past that, it would cancel the scan and you wouldn't get your results. So for a larger scan, it's really best practice to extend the length of that maximum scan duration to give you time to scan that website. All right, moving into scope. The scope is a very important part of scanning your website. Uh, it's possible sometimes that you just want to scan the front page or the home page or even a particular path. If that's something that you want to do, if you want to scan just testphp.vulnweb.com slash admin, then you can go to only entered URL and it'll only scan that particular page. If you were to do entered path and below, then it would continue on to any links crawled to that slash admin slash whatever. You know, if anybody knows any regex, I can go ahead and put a little star here. And we've got testphp.vulnweb.com slash admin and pretty much everything below is what that enter path and below will do. You don't need to put the star there. Uh, the enter path and below knows to do that. So you can just put that part of the URL and it'll crawl anything down below it. Whole domain has that ability to crawl everything down past the base URL. So even if you put this in, .com slash admin, it will crawl back up to the base URL and it will continue to crawl anything else it finds attached to the base URL. All right, so whole domain is our most like robust scope. All right, and then we have a few options, do not differentiate between HTTP and HTTPS protocols, as well as exclude URLs with regex, or you can flip that to include. This is if you want to, you know, maybe pull in, but include would be if you wanted to pull in URLs with regex. Uh, maybe there's a secret URL that doesn't have a link to it, and you want to include using that tool. Or if you want to exclude, let's say we wanted to exclude that admin page instead, and we wanted to make sure that, you know, that it's something like admin.php. And since we're working with regex, we can go ahead and escape that. And it won't crawl that admin page that is uh, on the, you know, testphp.boneweb.com. Right. There's also that button to exclude authentication pages. We have a few disallowed uh, HTTP method uh, options. So if you scroll through, you know, we we do suggest in best practice if you're scanning production to disallow the delete method. A lot of customers like to do that. 
Uh, it's really only affected, you know, legacy web applications in my experience, where, you know, the HTTP verbiage delete can actually um, have some type of an impact where it might remove something uh, as far as the disallowed HTTP methods. NetSparker scans in a read-only mode, so it does not affect the end target. All right. So as far as additional websites goes, this is if you have a full URL that you would like to pull in. Let's say you have an API. The API is associated with your target. This being our target right now, I'll go ahead and control copy. And I have an API that has a different uh, subdomain. Now, in order for me to bring that subdomain into the scope, not only do I need to have it under the websites list, so I need to already add it in the websites list, but I need to also bring it into the additional websites. So now I can scan rest.boneweb.com as well as testphp.boneweb.com because essentially those are all both on the same, uh, using the same web application. They just have two different domains. So now I've brought that domain into my scan. And next, I need to bring those API definitions in. And if you wanna take a second to review and look at the list of files we have, uh, most recently GraphQL was added to the list. For this example, I have a Postman file. that I can simply import. And now, you know, with APIs not being able to be uh, crawled, they don't have an attack surface that allow them, that allow the crawler to be able to, you know, fully flesh out an API. By importing the API, now I've got the API definitions with the URL, the HTTP verbiage. So I've got, you know, some Git methods, some post methods, some pages. And you can see that before I put that in the additional websites, it would not have scanned this because it was out of scope. I was able to pull that scope into the websites list and scan that API definition. All right, so now we've got our scope chosen uh, with the whole domain. We've used the additional websites to pull in our API. And then we've gone to links and API definitions to pull in a file, a Postman file, that will allow me to scan my API while scanning my web application. And some of the URL rewrites were automatically brought in. Uh, one thing I can emphasize here is you want enabled heuristic URL rewrite detection. So either set it to heuristic or custom, but make sure that button is checked. And with the scan time window, there is mostly self-explanatory. Um, you can select the scan. You can flip this back and forth if you would like. You can scroll it across. I mean, this is... Um, this is your ability to allow the scan to kind of run automatically or not run, depending on what time of day it is. Some customers only want to run a scan while they're in the office. And sometimes, you know, they want to run the scan during low bandwidth times. So you can set that here to automatically uh, allow the scan time window. And in this case, unlike the maximum scan duration, where it will cancel your scan and scan time window, it'll pause your scan. So when it reaches the red area, it pauses your scan. And once it reaches the green area, it'll continue the scan again. All right, I'm gonna turn that off for now. There are a few other features, you know, PCI scanning, which is like a network scan. It's an additional charge onto your license. You know, if you have it, it's simply clicking a button and it'll launch a separate PCI scan to scan network. There is our IAST feature, which is currently one of our newer features that we've added onto it with DAS scanning being the, uh, you know, that dynamic application scanning tool. Uh, it is, DAS is evaluating your uh, HTTP responses based on the requests sent by the tool. I asked requires you to put a little bit of software onto your server to see code running on your web application. And that allows us to see, you know, even more vulnerabilities than would be capable with a DAS scan. So we have a few platforms supported by that, .NET, PHP, Java, and Node.js. All right. And we'll jump to authentication. We do support many authentication methods, OAuth2 and many different flow types underneath it, including custom if you'd like to you know, build a custom OAuth2 flow process. Client certificate, 
header, which is commonly used with um, APIs. So if I were to enable header, we have our wizard tool that allows you to pick your, you know, authentication token types and can basically automatically create a, a authorization process for you. So if I were to select bearer and put some credentials in here, it can create that authorization for you and it puts that bearer and token in there. Or you can just create it by hand if you know what type of token and what type of verbiage you'd be using for that. NTLM Kerberos and form authentication, which I'll go into a little bit more depth on here. Right. And we'll see if our site is up for the day. Looks like we might be having some issues with the primary test site, but the secondary looks like it's up and running. So I will go ahead and use the secondary site and you can see you put the login form URL here and a persona is the username and password. So with the persona, I'll go ahead and add our very vulnerable persona for our vulnerable site. And we'll allow the tool to automatically do a login and log out. So what it's gonna do here now is it's gonna log in on the left and then it's going to detect the logout page on the right. And it's gonna do all this automatically by you know, identifying the username and password field and hitting the submit button with the tool. And then logging out on the page to detect what the logout URL is on the right side, which you'll be able to see here in just a second. And I'll give it a little time to load. Also a reminder, if you have any questions, you know, please feel free to ask questions in the uh, chat bar. There is a question section. All right, and you can see here on the left side, admin area, it's logged in for me. And you can see here on the right side, it's detected the logout page. And why this is important is, in this case, it's made a redirect based login page for me, or yeah, login area for me. Uh, the redirect based login is based on the URL that's provided when a application is logged out. The reason you wanna be able to detect a logout is if you're mid scan, the application will detect that it's on a login page and automatically re-authenticate you before it continues to try to scan. This can net you better results throughout the scan without you having to relaunch the entire scan. In this case, we have the URLs provided that will automatically detect by NetSparker. If you have dynamic URLs that aren't, you know, by nature dynamic is not consistent, uh, you can switch that over to keyword base. And what we can see here is that we can grab HTML text from the page and put it into the keyword patterns. And what NetSpark is gonna do is during the scan, if it connects with your keyword patterns, uh, all of them, then it will determine that it's on a login page and run your authentication process again. So we can make this more accurate by adding things from the page. So let's say username, password, uh, if there's anything else on the page, maybe we want to look at. Uh, looks like it's already detected a lot of this, but a lot of times, commonly, there's forgot password. You can put that text in there as well, and it will use all of that in its scans. And when it sees all those keyword patterns, automatically reauthenticate you. And we'll hit our OK, and we've got a nice green check mark. But let's say you have a slightly more complex authentication process. Um, if you know the secret key to your OTP, then you can actually insert the secret key in here and create almost like your own uh, one-time password generator here by putting in secret key, selecting the amount of digits, the period, the algorithm, things like that. And when you hit that G generate OTP button, if you put your secret key in there, you should get a nice green response. And you can put that into your custom script, which I'm about to show you next. All right. So with the custom script generation, one of the first things I like to do, hit that clear button. And what I'm doing here now is right clicking into fields where I want to generate code. Right clicking in the username, right clicking in the password, right clicking the submit button. I like to do buttons with delay. That's just my thing. It's not really a requirement. To me, it gives a more human feel. You can increase or decrease that delay here with that time, but you can manipulate the script here 
to uh, in, improve your authentication process, you know, if that's something that you need to do or something that you would like to test. So I'm going to go ahead and run a test script and it's going to automatically log me in using the process that I put in here. Now let's say uh, we need to put on the second page uh, an OTP or some type of hard-coded text. And I need to give this a quick second. You can see here the pages of the scripts, we can add multiple pages. So if I hit this plus button, now I'm on a second page. The second page will handle the redirect. So with page one, it handled that first portion of the script to authenticate me in. With page two, it goes through the redirect and then runs the script on page two. In this case, I can generate code and I can generate that button click again. So just by right clicking, I can generate the code that will react on the page. But you can see here in this white text, it's still trying to insert the username. Uh, for OTP, you can contact support and they can help you build the OTP portion of the script. So if you've already set up your one-time password, they can assist you with putting in your one-time password uh, portion to identify you know, where that is on your script and insert that OTP in there for the authentication purposes automatically. If you would like to hard code, it's as simple as here, putting in quotes on the side of your text. Once you put quotes in, it changes that color text from white to yellow, and we can actually hard code in whatever we would like to search for. So I'm going to search for my colleague's name. And it's, you see here, it has that button click as well. So when I run that test script, it is going to start at the first page, enter in the username password, hit that button click. Now we're on this admin area page where my hard coded text, which is my colleague's name, is going to be entered into the search for bar. And then that button click is gonna go on the second line of this page two script. There it is. And it hit the button. So you can see with the custom script, if you have a more uh, complicated authentication process, then we can help work around that by using the custom script to navigate your uh, HTTP, uh, whatever authentication process that you're working with. And we can see the custom script down here. If you'd like to copy that and put that into other profiles, uh, you can see your custom script, the page one and the page two. And you can see we still got our nice green check mark with the verify login logout. All right. Now you can see tagging down here as well again. If you would like to add tags to your scan as well. So not only do we have tags on groups, we have tags on websites, and you can add tags on scans. Uh, tagging is a feature that will come up a lot for you to be able to organize a large amount of uh, website scans, you know, whatever that may be. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit the update so that I save. Updating is saving and you should do it often. Uh, kind of brings back the uh, Microsoft Word days. All right, so now we see that our scan policy is set to extensive security checks. I wanna make this a custom scan policy. So I'm gonna go to policies before I launch this scan and create a custom scan policy for us. So I've got a long list of policies that I've already created. You can see some of them being optimized. You can see the technologies already chosen. You can see a few of the defaults we have here, like the compliance reports like OWASP and PCI. You can see our default checks that has the recommended security checks. The extensive has the all security checks. Uh, we can create Secure, uh, we can create scan policies from scratch using new scan policy or new optimized scan policy, or we can clone one that already exists. Let's say you've gone through the painstaking process of creating the perfect scan policy, but there's a couple of things you wanna change. You can always feel free to just clone one that you've already created, rename it, um, and just make your slight changes and just have different variations of one that you like. In this case, I am going to take the extensive security checks and to start off, I'm going to clone that. All right, and we will name this the Invicti policy for this example. All right, you can see here that I've shared it again. And here comes website groups where we can filter this policy to only work with certain website groups that will contain certain websites. You know, this is part of controlling permissions. Uh, this is part of sharing with your teammates, hitting that share button, just like we shared with the profile. 
So now not only am I sharing my profile with my teammates, I'm sharing my new policy with my teammates. And you can see here with the extensive checks, we have all the security checks just about, except for maybe a couple in signatures checked. So the extensive security checks is the most robust policy that we have. It's sending the entire kitchen sink at them. Um, you can make your adjustments here, changing in the editing feature. But before we do that, I'm going to optimize this policy to show you the difference of what a policy looks like before optimization and after optimization. You see here down here, the JavaScript content is set to default as well. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the save button. We're gonna come back out here, find our Invicti policy, and we're gonna optimize. And what optimization is, is selecting the technologies that you do have and deselecting the technologies that you do not have. Let's say we have a Linux only environment. We're running Apache and Apache Tomcat. Uh, we've got PHP and Java in there. And let's go ahead and say Python as well. And you know maybe we have SQL, uh, let's go Postgres. And as far as JavaScript content and Easy way to think of JavaScript content as far as the web application behavior goes for this tool is you know, the traditional pages that you load the entire page when you navigate to it is a little or no dynamic content site. Now, some of the newer pages that we see with a lot of these um, very creative sites where you have to scroll through and the site starts to envelop, you hover over things and, and actions take place on the site. That's the dy dynamic content it's referring to. Uh, when you talk about single page applications, when you're talking about Angular, when you're talking about you know, being able to, to go to certain parts of your web page and entire sections are unlocked by you doing mouse overs and scroll throughs. So in this case, I'm going to set that to complex single page application for our example. And with a resource finder, it's going to be fuzzing resources in the background. So you know, backup files, open search, you no, know, depends on what you want to uh, fuzz as far as it's looking for generic default names. And we still have our name, Invicti Policy. So now we've got our nice little graphical output where we can see the technologies that we have inside the application. And I'm going to go ahead and select Edit because we're going to do a deep dive on that policy that we just optimized. All right. So now when we go back to security checks, you can see a lot of these security checks have been deselected. Uh, they were automatically deselected in the optimization process based on what technologies we removed. So before it was just sending everything and now it's saying, hey, you don't have windows. So I removed these windows checks. And these are things that we're talking about with like code evaluations, cross-site scripting checks, you know, some of the ones that wouldn't pertain to your scan. If you know you don't have technologies in there, then it automatically pulls out those security checks that pertain to the technologies that you don't have. Now, you can feel free if you would like to come back in here and cover all your bases with cross-site scripting to come back and recheck any of these after optimization if scan speed isn't a problem. The, the purpose of optimization is to optimize the speed and the um, quality of your scan. If you're not concerned about the speed of your scan, you can come in here and you can re-add as many of these as you want. You can re-add all of them. Um, it really undoes what you did with the optimization, but if, if speed isn't an issue, then that's not an issue. And then we can come to sections like this with crawling. Uh, I will keep this page open because we'll have to use this in, when we're relating to the knowledge base, but crawling really affects the depth that the crawler will go through to get to all the links that you've put into your scope. So your crawling page limit, if you check whole domain, if your crawling page limit is too low, then NetSparker will not crawl through the entire sitemap. Uh, it will identify links that were uh, detected, but it won't crawl through them if it reaches that limit. Same thing goes you know, with maximum signature, maximum page visits. And remember with NetSparker support, netsparker.com slash support, you know, you can get a little more depth on any of these. You can also hover over these question marks to see what a little description and the minimum and maximum numbers of these are. So, you know, don't be too worried about coming in here and increasing the number a little bit. What it does is it increases the length of your scan, but it has the ability to increase the quality of your scan if you need to be able to scan your own, uh, your whole web application. 
So you can see this is set to nine, but it goes as high as 9,999. So it's nowhere near the maximum. So there are situations where maybe you need to increase maximum signatures, maximum page visits. You can see the numbers here. Maybe I wanna bump that up to 200. Um, you can do some of these uh, options where you can fall back to Git. We can walk through this. We looked at that JavaScript content earlier where we set it to large SPA. And you can see here with the presets, you can see these numbers lowering and raising by my defined presets. Now, defined presets aren't written in stone. You can come here to the question mark and you can see that this goes up into the millions. It's currently in the uh, not that. We can change this number if we want to, you know, 800,000 if we'd like to. So we can see here that, you know, maybe we need to do these longer simulated events. With maximum simulated uh, elements, um, DOM simulation timeout, DOM load timeout, this is loading the page. And what the attacker is doing, it's loading the page, scrolling through in a simulated manner and mousing over in a simulated manner to unlock parts of your page. If you have a single page application with a lot of dynamic content, you need these numbers to be you know, pretty reasonable. Like the presets are great. Uh, if you notice that it's not really getting a good flesh out of your pages, then you can increase the numbers around the presets and you can see the minimums and maximums even more to try to flesh out the entire scan of your page. All right, and we've got a lot of options down here for uh, JavaScript content. You can see the attacking behavior where we can add attacks to the refer header user agent. You can attack the cookies. You can increase the number of parameters that you attack on a single page. Custom 404 behavior, scoping. And remember with the policy, we're dealing with the low level behavior. Policy is what's actually going to be steering your crawling and your attacking. So that's why we're selecting security checks here. That's why we're picking crawling depth. That's why we're controlling the JavaScript content. These are the nuts and bolts. Uh, whereas the profile was high level, this is low level and this is the actual, you know, boots on the ground getting work done. Ignored parameters, form values. Where form values is the actual um, values that are input into forms found on your pages. So with form values, we can see that, you know, if it does run across a form that has email in the field, it's going to put this email in here. In your environment, you might change this to something else. You might change this to something internal to your environment where you can change that second level domain to match with your own second level domain. Or if you would like to change the name when it runs into a name field, you can add, you change Smith to you know whatever you would like to change it to. If uh, you want to add blocks, we have that option to add blocks down here. Maybe instead of just generic name, you wanna put last name or surname and put a value here. So it's, you can tailor it a little bit more towards your own web application. Brute forcing uh, for my standard and on-prem users, you can change your rainbow table in your uh, configuration files. For my on-demand cloud users, you can contact support and update your own rainbow table that has your own username and password combinations. And you can increase this number. I believe it goes as high as 1500 on the brute force testing. There's autocompletes that are uh, scanned for, ignored email addresses, cross-site request forgery settings, as far as uh, you know, login form values and input values for that. Web storage, uh, extensions here. You can control the behavior for extensions. Uh, if Let's go to a common one. We all know what a GIF is or GIF, depending on you know, how you wanna pronounce the word. There's the crawl only parameter, uh, but you can decrease that. Let's say you have a lot of GIFs on your page. Uh, you can change that value to do not crawl so that you can save some time on your scan because you're not really concerned with a you know, DAS scanner looking at your GIFs. Um, or you can increase, let's say you want your attack parameters to also attack the query string. So you can control the behavior that it has with extensions within your web application. As well as request. So this is the, in different sections, as user agent, we've got the default that is Chrome for the user agent, but you can change that to an edge agent. You can change that to a Googlebot agent. And this changes the browser that's simulated with. So when we're talking about it, going through those simulations, loading the pages, even what your uh, web application will identify, the scanner's browser, 
this is what you're changing. You're changing it to, you know, IE7, maybe you're coming from a very old Internet Explorer browser. Uh, you can change that to Safari if you want, an iPhone browser, a Mac OS browser. You know, we have a lot of options here for you to change the you know, pre predefined user agent. Excuse me. All right, and with request, we have the request timeout. We have concurrent connections and we have requests per second. You can increase or decrease these depending on how you would like to. It really just physically can ramp up the speed of your scan. If you would like a shorter time for the timeout to increase the speed of your scan, or if you would like to increase the number of concurrent connections, we can get a little mouse over for you know how that behavior goes when uh, the scanner and the crawler is actually using the you know request per second and things like that. You can increase the request per second. Uh, the now increasing it too much could cause a denial of service simulation in a sense. So there are you know certain limits, especially with certain web applications. Some web applications are built much smaller and can't handle nearly as much as you know larger web applications. So you do need to be mindful about you know what your settings are. So if we were to decrease the request timeout down to 10 seconds and then bump up the concurrent connections up to like 25 and then just max out the request per second, you know, that can be viewed as a denial of service attack that you're hosting on yourself. The defaults are usually great for speed, but if you would like to speed up your scan a little bit, you know, you can come here and physically, you know, pull that slider right over and increase your concurrent connections. All right, let me reset these. There's also a capture HTTP request button. That button is by default off, but if you run a scan and you would like to collect all the HTTP requests and responses, you can click this button on. It's a great tool for auditing. It will create a Fiddler file in your report that you can download to look at everything the crawler and the scanner did during the scan. All right, there's also header values. If you would like to change your HTTP header values or even add one, you have the potential to, you know, add one for you like, for in this case, I could put Invicti team here. Uh, Invicti team would be added to my HTTP headers, which would be great for your SIM team to be able to know that they can um, put those keywords into their search engine and be able to identify all your HTTP packets by looking for the keywords in Victi Team. All right, and a little bit more information on you know, SSL and TLS information. We have TLS 1.3 now. If you'd like to take a blast from the past, you can go look at SSL version three as well, or add those security protocols to your policy. All right, again, I know we breezed over that really quickly, but you can go to netsparker.com slash support if you would like a little bit more information on it. All right, so I'm going to leave this edit page up. While going to the recent scans, but first let me pop into the scan profile. All right, so we're gonna go back to our Invicti profile. Now that we've gone and we've made our policy, we've gone through the painstaking process of selecting all the numbers and configuration settings we would like with our policy, now we need to come back and add that policy into our scan. So now we have a scan profile, Invicti profile. It's got our authentication, it's got our scope, it's got our additional websites, you know, everything, all that good stuff. And we've got our scan policy now pulled into this new scan. And I'm gonna hit update. And essentially we are ready to launch this scan. You know, there are a few other auxiliary things like report policy and authentication profile, you know, I know we didn't cover, but as far as the nuts and bolts, uh, the, the bread and butter of this situation, then we can launch the scan now because we have a profile set and a policy set, in my opinion, best practices. That's definitely what you want before you launch a scan. And let's say we've already launched our scan. We've gotten our results and we want to be able to uh, determine, you know, hey, you know, how did that go? Um, you know, let me go ahead and look at a report. We have two things. We have a dashboard with php.testsparker.com. We're going to switch up the test site. We have the dashboard that has a nice graphical output of the post-scan analysis, including identifying technologies. 
the scanner will fingerprint technologies that you can use to optimize future scans. As well as, you know, being able to look at things like a trend matrix report that will identify, you know, what vulnerabilities were found across multiple scans. So if this is your third or fourth time, or many more than that, as long as it's more than one, uh, scanning a site, then you'll have something called a trend matrix report, where you can actually review the issues that were fixed and issues that appeared new and not fixed issues. All right, let me drop back into recent scans. And let me go back in and view a report. All right, now report is like your base of operations for reviewing a scan that you've already run. You come to a report and you can see here that we can view our issues. We can see the request and response. We can take action on our issues. We can mark them as accepted risk. We can mark them as false positive. We can mark them as fixed unconfirmed. A fixed unconfirmed issue will cause the issue to automatically trigger a scan for just that issue and it will retest it to determine if it's still there. If it finds it's still there, it'll put it back in the to-do pile. If it's fine and it's fixed, then it'll put it as a fixed issue. We have the ability to update tagging. I can change assignees. I can add tags to my issue. There goes tagging again. I can add notes to the issue so that we can track work that we do with the issue over time. I can see that this issue was confirmed. This is Invicti's stamp of approval. You can see a little stamp there saying that hey, this is a confirmed vulnerability. Um, Invicti has confidence that this vulnerability exists and that it's not a false positive. It even provided the, fault, uh, the proof of exploit, as well as some things like the impact of the vulnerability, actions to take, ways to remedy it, remedy references. We pull in third-party references into the application as well to help you remedy, and help you identify what vulnerability it is. We have the ability to see the site map if you'd like to crawl through the site map discovered, the knowledge base as well. So we have the knowledge base is a fantastic tool for post scanning. We're talking about out of scope links. Let's see, in this case, crawling page limit was exceeded by 500 links. If I were to go back and look at that crawling, there goes that crawling page limit. Looking at the out of scope links is a great way to know that you can go back to your policy, increase that crawling page limit, and then rerun the scan to include all these links that were left out because the scan didn't have a high enough crawling page limit. Uh, things that you can look at like um, crawling performance, scan performance as far as you know per vulnerability, you can see the amount of executions for those vulnerabilities and the time they took. You can see things like web pages with inputs, like when we were talking about the form values previously. Now I can navigate to these pages and go see those pages that have input values there. And now that I know the pages that have input values, I can custom tailor those form values to match those input values. All right, a lot of information here that you can you know, go through and look uh, and just learn more about your web application from the point of view of the scanner. Uh, at the top here, we can rerun our scan. If you'd like to rerun a quick incremental scan on that, we can download our scan data. If you did capture that Fiddler file from the policy, another button would be created to say download HTTP request. This is where we can export our reports, our compliancy reports, our, um, our detailed scan, our executive summary report. There is the crawled URLs and scanned URLs. Uh, those two will provide you the response code for every single URL from your scan. So it's a great tool to be able to determine, you know, were you getting those good 200 response codes every time you navigate it to a URL or were you getting something like 500 unauthorized or, or 404s or things like that? All right, so we have covered recent scans. We've looked at the knowledge base. We've looked at issues from this standpoint. Issues here and issues here are fundamentally the same. Whatever you do here will affect your issue in the to-do pile or you know, if you want all issues or addressed issues or things like that. Uh, there is you know, one difference when you come to the issues tab where you can see the history of an issue. So you can actually see whether that issue has been you know, put in different states or you know, who it's been assigned to. 
but we have fundamentally the same things where we can uh, change assignees, we can change the states, we can add notes. Uh, with the technologies tab, the technologies that we saw on the dashboard, we have an entire section for you to be able to review your technologies here. If you would like to use this to you know, improve your policies, you can come to the technology side and optimize your policies using that. We have notifications in case you would like to build some automation into your notification section. Uh, by creating these notifications, we can, and I'll edit down into this, we can set up some type of autom automation where testphp.vulnerweb.com was the site that we were using for the demo. Now, when a scan is completed on that site, you can see that here, I have the scope set to website. You could change it to group or any site if you'd like. For this example, we'll keep it a website. Um, you can even uh, select if you run multiple scans on this, you can select scan group. Scan group would be different groupings of policies with your uh, website, profiles and policies with your website. And from here, you can start adding in your email recipients. Here, I've got three email recipients. And as far as the on-demand version, I can add SMS recipients. Um, it's not available on the on-demand or the standard, but you can put SMS recipients on the on-demand or on, it's not available on on-prem, excuse me. Uh, you can add filters. You can attach reports to the email and you can put in integrations. So to do a quick review, upon the event of a scan completed on this website, these three will receive an email uh, an email filtered for severity with three attached reports in these formats. Four integrations will also receive the information as well. So I have JIRA, ServiceNow, and Slack, and Teams all put into the integration section. The JIRA and ServiceNow will have the issues updated as a, um, as, you know, whatever the platform uses as the verbiage, but it'll basically be tickets. And with Slack and Teams, it'll just get a notification that the scan completed. All right. And with the integrations, you can see the integrations list here. We support many uh, platforms as far as issue tracking systems, uh, project management boards, CICD platforms, uh, communication, most commonly Slack and Teams. Uh, we do support PAM. PAM can be put into your form authentication. Um, I can actually show you where that is right now. One second. So here, if I had a PAM integration, I can actually add that to where the persona section is. So instead of adding a persona, I can actually put a PAM integration here. And we have those two, CyberArk and HashiCorp, available right now. Uh, there's always more in development. With API, if you know how to use APIs, uh, NetSparker has a very rich and powerful API. Go ahead to API settings. And you can see here that we can show you list of operations that you can use with building an API into NetSparker. So you're not completely limited to just the applications we've built around here. We do have the API that allows you to build your own custom application support around the NetSparker API or using our webhook in Zap or Zapier. All right. And then a couple of other things I want to cover before we enter a question and answer uh, portion is, you know, teams, as far as members, roles, and teams, uh, you can control permissions. Uh, a lot of how this works works with how you group your websites as well. That's a very important part. So adding members and in best practice, putting those members on teams and assigning the roles to your teams, as well as agents. If there are portions of your, um, the, if there are assets that you would like to scan that are internal and not publicly facing, and you're having difficulty reaching them, putting agents into your internal environment that can be placed on Docker, Linux, or Windows servers. All right, so now we'll enter, you know, a question and answer portion. Uh, Mark may be answering some of your questions um, or myself. So Mark, have you picked out any questions that you'd like? Hey Mark, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, I've actually been answering all the questions um, as they've been coming in live. So there's more than I, I think there's over maybe 20 
questions um, okay. that we've got answered already. Um, some, hopefully, I uh, understood properly. But if there's any questions, um, I see another one just popped in. And then uh, another one here. Let's see. All right. OK, so Any, anything um, that came up multiple times that you'd like to point out? Um, yeah, so the last question came up already. Um, no, um, there's not a free um, like site that you can use that would essentially, when I say free, you can, there's nothing that you can essentially use that would not count against your target license. Um, every FQDN that's entered, whether it's something that you have as a as a play application or not, it will consume a target in your license. Um, so there's no like you know, um, you know, free type of uh, FQDN that you can add into that. Um, and let's see here. So if two different policies are doing the same check, um, so I'm not sure. I don't know if you understand that one, Mark. Um, if two different policies are doing the same check, i.e., password length, which one takes priority? Um, so if we're talking about scan policies, it'd be one scan policy at a time because you can only have one policy tied to your scan. Um, and you can't really scan the same site uh, simultaneously using the tool, right? So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question there. Uh, do you have anything to add on to that one, Mark? Uh, yeah, just showing them that, you know, here's where you put your scan policy in. So yeah, you're only one, running one scan policy per scan. And you can't scan the same FQDN, you know, twice or at the same time, simultaneously, concurrently. Yeah. Um, now, if there are buttons that you want to exclude from being quick, you can go into the policy. I believe it's um, there is a CSS selector area. You can go into the website. Uh, you can do an inspect of the uh, website, you know, uh, in your browser and you can identify the CSS code and you can um, exclude that in your um, in your policy. Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly where it is in there, Mark, but just give me one second while you're looking for it. I'm looking at some of the other questions. I believe that's under uh, ignored parameters if you know how to uh, put those patterns in. Um, what are the and just as a heads up, we did, we did just add the ability to uh, create, you know, custom header text for your page. So if you'd like to put your company name here, you know, so I can put NVICD here. Or if you'd like to add a login banner so that you deliver a message, a uh, custom one, or, you know, maybe one of the nuclear regulatory commission office ones, uh, you can add banners to your login as well. Uh, you can control your IAST bridge if you're using uh, the shark IAST feature. And you're also able to change what your default policy is. So if you found a favorite policy you have and you want to set it to the default so that every, um, every target that you have will automatically use this policy, and let's say the Invicti one that we created is the one that I want to automatically default be used unless you change it. I can set that here. I can also set a default report policy as well. Upon hitting um, save, you can see the Invicti name here. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so yeah, F, uh, to clarify, um, so there's two kind of related questions. An FQDN can be, so you have your main FQDN. If you have domains or subdomains off of the main FQDN, you don't need to create a new target for that. Um, you can use that FQDN with a slash, right, to specify the subdomain in your scan profile. So there's another question about how do you crawl service requests that are on another subdomain? Uh, the same thing. So in the scan profile, if the main FQDN is the same, um, you would just specify the subdomain in the scan profile and uh, specify that as your path in the uh, in the scan. Uh, so asking the question again, answer not clear. How will the application adjust getting scanned for one hour versus 10 hours? So um, I'm not sure of the where you're seeing the um, time, one hour versus 10. But if we're talking about in the scan profile, duration. Talking, the duration, that, that maximum scan duration is not the, the time that we're saying that we will allow this, like we won't 
we will allow it to scan, like if you had an application and let's say your application took a long time to scan based on the behavior of the application. And let's say it took, uh, you know, uh, 24 hours and maybe our policy and our organization says, we don't want anything running more than 24 hours because it's showing that maybe it's in a, in a state of disrepair, I don't know. Um, you can set a time duration to where if it meets that threshold, the scan will just cancel. So setting that scan time duration is really just allowing, you're, set it, you're saying I will only allow my scans to run for this long before it cancels. Does yeah, that or do anything to add hours. to that? If, uh, if it runs for 10 hours, then you know you just it runs for 10 hours. We're just saying it won't allow it to run anymore than what the max duration is. The limitations of incremental scans are that it will only, when you run an incremental on, based off of your last full scan, um, then it'll only look, incremental scans will only look for newly found crawled paths. Anything else, um, uh, it, it won't look for the original items. But um, we are at time, guys, and I know there's a lot of yep. questions coming in, but um, Mark, you want to take it away? Absolutely. Uh, and just on the incremental scans, your knowledge base when you run an incremental scan will actually show the information that it is unchanged, changed, and new. Uh, so we're at maximum time. Um, I'm going to close this webinar down. But I'd like to thank everybody who attended this. Uh, this is our first NVIC-D uh, webinar. And, you know, we'll be having many more in the future. And I hope, uh, you know, everyone can attend webinars that pertain to them. Uh, you know, uh, please give any feedback if you'd like us to change anything about these webinars, if you'd like us to add information or change the way we conduct them. Um, you know, it, it was great having everyone here. And, you know, hope to see you again. All right, you have anything, Mark? No, that's it for me. Thanks, everybody.